So welcome everyone to our September Memory Lab Network webinar. And our guest today, I get to be in person with, is Mary Mannix, the head of the Maryland Room. The Maryland Room Manager. Maryland Room at Manager. Frederick County Public Libraries in Frederick, Maryland. Yes, which is about an hour away from Washington, D.C. Yeah. And actually, I am now sitting currently in the public library that was my public library during high school. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, my mom still lives about 20 minutes away, what I learned today. Uh, it still takes 20 minutes. Um, so Mary uh, has a lot of experience working in public libraries and archives in public mm -hmm. libraries, and then also oral history. So if you want to talk about your background or get started, whatever you want. Why don't we get started? Because one of the slides is a reminder of me great. to talk about who I am. Okay, so great. that would be good. And, I, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. Thank you, Siobhan, for of having course. me. Thank you. I'm very and this is my first time on this side of a webinar. I would have gotten my hair done if I'd really thought it through. Um, but thank you very much for, for coming here to listen to me today. And my PowerPoint is mostly just to keep me going. It's not the most sophisticated thing on the planet, but I'll keep going. Pull that up for you guys. So. There you go. Okay, so we are off and running. So hopefully I understood what Siobhan really wanted from me today. But what you'll be getting is, as you can see there, oral history, a practical introduction. So it's just a really kind of basic overview of the very basics of doing oral history, of not necessarily establishing an oral history project, but to interface with people who are doing oral history and also potentially, you know, to train those folks of yours who may be doing oral history for you. So who am I, you may be wondering. You know, why am I the lucky one on the side of it today? Or I'd also like to think of it as sort of like, what is my oral history about oral history? So here's kind of my resume in a synopsis. Um, I'm a practicing archivist. I went to library school to become an archivist. Uh, because I work in a public library and a local history collection, most of my patrons are genealogists. So while I identify as an archivist, my day-to-day -day life is mostly as a genealogy librarian. And because I work in a public library, because I'm an archivist, and because I do also have this, uh, two history degrees, I'm also a working public historian. I am not a folklorist. I'm not an academically trained oral historian. Over my archival career, I have taken a number of workshops relating to oral history. Um, I, I curate oral histories. I just actually got a very sizable oral history collection from Frederick Community College, which is our local community college here. I have seen lots of oral histories throughout my career. And again, I have been trained, but I haven't gone to grad school for oral history. I haven't taken an academic course on oral history. So um, the way I view it is oral history is very much as many aspects of genealogy and public history and local history, it can be a very grassroots effort, and that's pretty much where I'm coming from. I have seen some really bad, seen or heard some really bad oral histories during my day, and I have seen some wonderful oral histories that have been done. I've seen some oral histories that have come to collections completely undocumented, and some that are essentially almost useless to anyone in the future. But again, I've seen some wonderful things happen. Uh, Frederick County Public Library, as you guys may know, does have a memory lab. It's located out of our Urbana branch, which is about a half hour to the south of us here. And I am not actually directly a part of the memory lab, but I'm affiliated with it. And one of my affiliations with it is that there is an oral history arm to the memory lab, and I'm the one who gets to train the volunteers for the oral history for the memory lab. I also am one of the interviewers for it as well. I've done three interviews so far. Um, I also have been very intimately involved in doing the oral history project at my alma mater, which actually is Hood College right here in town. I say I'm the lead interviewer. I'm the only interviewer for that. Um, so I've been kind of thrown in it to it that way. Also, we had um, the ALA Latino American grant, I guess about three years ago now, which also involved doing oral history. So I will admit that I spent most of my career, again, while I took oral history workshops, I went to sessions at the conference about oral history. 
But I spent a lot of time scoffing at oral history because, again, I had collections where I had these tapes that were really had very little content on them. But then I was thrown into the world of actually having to train people in doing oral history and also having to actually do it myself. And I was a very quick convert. I now spread the gospel of oral history. I love being an interviewer, and I really see the importance. And it's kind of like, well, before I was, again, very much a scoffer. Now the light has shined on it, and I do it from a much, much different way. I also am very spoiled is that I never had to learn to work a camera. I do have a colleague here who has a degree in video kinds of things, and he's always my cameraman. So this is going to be very much on the side of the person who's spoiled, who doesn't have to learn how to work any equipment, but who actually just does the interviews. Okay, so what is oral history, you may be asking. Oral history is actually pretty straightforward. It is recording the oral memories of the oral story of someone, um, either done audio with just straight audio, with video. Um, that's really what oral history is. It's sitting somebody down and recording their story. Okay, who does oral history? Lots and lots of people do oral history. Um, really, throughout the 20th century, oral history, is, as probably many of you know, has been kind of a growing methodological phenomena, you know, even going back to the WPA project where um, it, where the slaves, the former slaves were, the enslaved people were interviewed. Also, genealogists do a lot of oral history. Um, one of the beginning parts of genealogy methodology is actually to sit down and interview your family. So most genealogists do some form of oral history as well. And oral history with the growth of social and cultural history throughout the 20th century has become even more an intricate part of doing local history or public history. Why would someone do oral history? One of the major reasons to do oral history is to capture those stories, that those, those memories, those events that are not documented in any other form. Um, again, if we go back to the slave project of the WPA project, you know, the stories of these people that had never, ever been documented before. In my own local community here, we have an African-American group, Arch, who has done some phenomenal work lately, and they have what they call their living treasures, who are people in 90 and their hundreds, and they have recently done oral histories for those individuals. Again, people whose stories may not be told completely. You know, most of us, while we live in a time where we're very heavily documented, I mean, I'm sure all of us could right now reach to our purses or wallets and pull out five different forms of identification, just because we're heavily documented doesn't mean that the story of our lives, the way we the way we experienced it, is being presented in the same way. It's two different things, how we appear in documents and then how we would narrate our own story, keeping in mind that everyone's story is a little different and everybody has a story. So by collecting oral histories for local history, public history, if you're doing an oral history of a Senate, you know, you're getting those stories that aren't going to be documented any other way, but also providing another form of documentation that would support the regular written documentation, that would support the records that are being created. What is the end product? That's where it gets tricky. You know, you do have the idea of oral history just for the sake of doing oral history. But to more effectively do oral history, it's usually useful to have something at the end that you want to do. You know, it's not enough to just go out into your community and find a lot of old people and interview them. It's the idea of we want to find out what the experience might have been. For example, in Frederick County, if you lived in downtown Frederick and you're an African American during the time period that you couldn't walk through the local park. Um, right now, again, with my alma mater, Hood College, the focus of oral history, um, Hood was a women's college until very recently. Men were only able to attend there starting in the 60s, but it became fully um, integrated male and female men living on campus about 15 years ago. So the focus of our oral history for, for Hood at this point in time is to collect those stories of that time when men started to live on campus. So the more effective oral history generally, particularly if you're going out in the world and collecting oodles of oral history, is to have some idea of what it is that you want to collect. What is the stories you want to glean? Because you can sit somebody down for seven hours and still come away with perhaps an interesting story. You may have had seven lovely hours chatting to this person, but it doesn't provide you with any sort of document type that can be used then by someone researching the community. So it's good to have an end product in mind, whether, again, I just want to collect the stories of my family, I want to collect stories that relate to a particular experience, 
um, I want to find out what it was life was like living in a certain place at a certain time. It doesn't mean that every time you sit an interesting person down to oral history, you have to have that in mind, but it's good to have some concept of what the end product is, whether or not you're just doing a documentary, whether or not you're doing, you're going to eventually write a book on a certain topic. It's good to have something in mind about what you are striving for. Okay, the real basics, okay. Um, let's make believe you already have people in mind, that you already have some idea of, of people that you may want to interview or the types of people you may want to interview. So let's say, okay, on Friday at 10 o'clock, Mr. Smith is coming into, and we're going to interview Mr. Smith, okay? You need to have a plan. You need to have some idea of what you want to talk to Mr. Smith about. It's usually not enough, again, just to say, he's an interesting guy, he's 95, he can tell us all sorts of things. You want to have some idea of what you want to talk to Mr. Smith about. What is the point of talking to him on that one day? Do you want to know about his life growing up as a tenant farmer? Do you want to know what his life was like when he was in World War II? Do you want to know what it was life was like when he was a single dad living downtown? What is it that you really want to glean from that one particular interview? Which isn't to say that every time you sit somebody down, you have to have a huge concept of what you want to bring forth from them. But the best thing to do, the most effective interviews are going to come when you have some idea of what it is that you want to ask them and that what your final goal may be. That's why often in a lot of local history collections you'll have, as I was alluding to before, and the reason I was not a believer for many years, is you will have a collection of 25 tapes where these interesting people were interviewed, but the interviews give you absolutely no information that is useful to any researcher in the future. It's just as if, you know, again, while we all have stories to tell, not all of our diaries necessarily be useful for 10 years from now. Not everything that we produce in our lives, to use archival terms, would be records of enduring value. Not every letter we write home is of interest. There may be letters that are of it. Not every email we sent and not every text we send will be worth saving till the end of time or even for 50 years or five years. But there may be those letters, those emails that are. And that's the same thing talking to people. If you just think about, you know, all the delightful conversations you have with whoever it is you have dinner with at night or when you talk to grandma, some of these conversations have a lot of informational content. A lot of them may even have sort of a vague artifactual content. But not every conversation we have does. And not every time you sit down with someone to do an oral history, no matter how interesting they are, no matter how wonderful life experiences they are, if you just sit down for an hour and chat, you may not come up with something that's going to be of use to anybody in the future. So have a plan. Go in with some idea of what it is you want to talk to them about on that day at that hour. And also do some research. You know, spend some time before they arrive. So you've known Mr. Smith for seven years since you've worked at your job. You see him every day at the circulation desk. You invite him to come on down. You have lovely talks. But before he gets there, do a little bit of research. Find out something about him. You know, even if you sit down and ask him background questions or give him a survey. Um, you know, where were you born? What is your birth date? Who are your parents? All that real basic information. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to then ask him those same questions when you're interviewing him. But you want to go in with some idea of did he serve in World War I? Did he serve in World War II? Maybe you always have known he's a World War II veteran. But you find out in the interview that he spent the whole time as a file clerk in Bethesda, Maryland. That's going to be a much different interview than if he was at Guadalcanal. So again, to have some idea. Not that you need to know every detail before you go in, but you need to know some basics. Do some research. If you have access to the local newspaper, you know, go into there and take a look at his names. See when he appears. Come up, with, again, with, with basic background questions. This is particularly useful if you know that your oral history project, if you're doing a project, but if the oral histories you were doing during that time period have a certain, you know, end uh, value. You know, again, you want to document this experience, this thing that happened. Maybe in your background questions, either that you talk to him in person, call him on the phone, give him a, a survey to fill out before he comes in to see you. You know, ask, oh, where did you go to school? So if you're looking at the history of segregated Frederick County, you know, where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Um, where did you work? Those sorts of things that then can kind of guide what you're going to be doing in the interview. So most of the thing is know something about this person before you sit down with them. Have some idea. Or you may, may just spend an hour not gleaning anything at all, or at the end of the hour, you're then ready to get going, but now, now everyone's tired. So go in with some idea of what you want to talk to them about, and also go with, with some idea of who they are and why they are there. 
It's also the kind of basic, you know, whenever you have a conversation with somebody, you know, if you, if you have a better idea of who they are, it will make a more useful conversation. So I'm just going to quickly talk about the equipment, which, um, you know, I spend my time not having anything to do with. But if you are the person handling the equipment, you know, know your equipment, know how it works. It may seem pretty straightforward, but it's important. And make sure that your camera, whether you're using, um, you know, a fancy video camera, whether or not you're using your phone, whether you just found an old tape recorder in the back room and you've got 75 big tapes and you're going to use those, just have some idea how it works. When you bring Mr. Smith in for that wonderful hour, that's not the time to figure out how do you turn it on. Or make sure that you do have power plugs near you. Make sure that your batteries are charged. Make sure all that is set before they come into the room. Um, it's sort of, I kind of compare it very similar to, you know, I'm, I'm old. And when I first started actually working, when I did some secretarial work, we had a lot of computer classes. And the computer troubleshooting class, you know, the first things we always learned is, you know, is your computer plugged in? So before you call your IT department, is your computer plugged in? Is your power on? Okay. Does your camera work? Do you know where the on and off is? Do you have a plug nearby if you run out of batteries? Um, my volunteer, John, who's actually watching the desk today while we're back here, he was at National Archives on Wednesday taking some photos of Civil War um, pension records. And he brought two extra batteries with him, and the batteries didn't work, you know. So make sure you're all lined up. You know, things will happen. You know, all hell can break loose at different times. But go in as well prepared as you can be to know your equipment, even if you're not the one running the equipment. Um, Siobhan can probably address this much better than I did, but my guy always tells me, if you can afford an external mic, get yourself an external mic, okay? That's all I have to say on that, because that's all I know, you should have one. Okay, um, Okay. for the interview itself, okay, like I said, prepare, be prepared, have some idea of this person, is, and then come in with a list of questions, you know? After you've talked to them on the phone or sat down with them before they come in, you know, when you go through some of the real academic oral history books, they will actually talk about having a pre-interview. Now, I know that's not always possible. A lot of us are dealing with very small amounts of time. It's not as if we've got two years to do all these oral histories in order to then finish our dissertation 10 years from now. If we have this quick oral history project, if we're interviewing people who are not necessarily young, we may have to get them when we can. But after you do the research, do the basic research, come in with a list of questions, okay? Now, also do not underestimate, um, you may have 35 questions and you only get through five or ten of them. You know, that is perfectly fine. Probably better to write more questions than less questions. But the big thing is to not be tied to your questions. You're going to go in with questions. You're going to start very basic. But then if it veers off into some other way, if the interview goes what you consider to be a better way, if you're getting wonderful information, don't think you have to keep coming back to the questions themselves. But you need to start with the questions. And although I have not put this on my little PowerPoint cheat sheet, when you start an interview, it's usually best to actually, when you sit down with them, is say who you are, say what the date is, say where you are, say who they are, and then ask them to introduce themselves. I like to think of this as like the title page of a book. You know, um, for, for those of us who work in libraries, particularly those who work in public libraries or local history collections, you know, we get a lot of books, and we use books in a very broad sense that don't have title pages. But there's a reason that publishers put title pages in books. So think of the first three minutes, the first two minutes as being your title page. You know, I am Mary Mannix, and I'm here today on September 28th, 2018, and I am in the Maryland Conference Room of the Fever Arts Public Library, and the time is now 2.55, and I'm here with Bob Jones. Bob, could you tell me your full name? And and then at that point, ask him or her real basic questions. You know, ask for their full name, even if you've just said it. So, Bob, tell me who you are. It may seem silly, but ask them for their full name. Ask them for who their parents were. Again, it puts them into place and time. It's creating that title page. And then ask them, you know, so, Bob, if you don't mind telling me, just when were you born and where were you born? It's that real basic information. Again, it's the title page. It's then for someone who maybe in the future looking at the interview, they may suddenly realize, that's the wrong Bob Jones. That's not the Bob Jones I want. But to put it in place in time, you know, to create your title page, okay? So you've spent, you know, a week interviewing, well, not interviewing, you spent a week um, researching Bob. You, then you've come in, you have your list of questions. 
you know to start with your questions, but don't be tied to your questions, okay? When you create your questions, when you write them, try not to ask yes or no questions. Oral history is kind of like a conversation. Um, though it's, it's what you want it to be in some ways is very much a one-person conversation from the other side, and you're just propelling them forward. So if you just ask yes or no questions, it's going to be a very boring interview. So try not to do that. Occasionally you may need to kind of as filler questions or bridge questions to get to the next question, but try not to ask yes or no questions. Okay, and always let them finish what they're saying. This is a problem that I actually find that I have sometimes because they may say something that gets me so excited that I want to ask my next question or I have this new wonderful brainstorm idea. Oh, I'm now going to ask about that time that they were thrown out of college because they mentioned that. Um, always let them finish what they're saying, no matter what. Just let them keep going. And don't be afraid of silence. If suddenly they stop talking, don't feel you need to fill that void because they may be thinking or they may be getting to the point of saying something else. Be sure that they are finished before you go forward with your next question. And don't be afraid of emotion. If someone starts getting weepy, if someone starts getting angry, as long as they're not getting angry at you, that's all perfectly fine. It's part of the experience. You may be eliciting all sorts of feelings and emotions and memories from them. Um, here at Frederick County Public Libraries, we were a time of the, when the official collecting partners, the official collecting partner of the Frederick County Veterans History Project, which was our lo local portion of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. And I've listened to a few of them. I never did any of those interviews, but I have spoken to many of the interviewers who often will mention that particularly the World War II guys will tell interviewers things they would never ever tell their families and in the process of that many of them would break down and they would remember things that they hadn't remembered in years and while to you it may seem embarrassing as long as they don't ask you to stop just give them time you know pass them a box of tissues um but just let it go just let it keep going don't stop because someone's getting upset or because someone's crying unless they ask you to and actually, if someone asks you to stop the camera, do everything you can to kind of convince them not to stop the camera. But obviously, you don't want to embarrass your people. If they want you to stop, stop. But don't let any of that stop you. I mean, don't. If someone's silent, don't let that bother you. If they get emotional, don't let that bother you. It's all part of the process. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's what you're trying to. I mean, you're not trying to make people cry but you're trying to get legitimate stories from people and often getting those legitimate stories involve having them remember things that they've never remembered before and sometimes as i was saying talking to a stranger can be much much different than talking to a family member and using the veterans is the best example men who you know before never said anything to their families about their experiences and never broke down even in front of their wives telling a complete 16 year old stranger they suddenly do start eliciting those emotions and that is perfectly fine as long as it's perfectly fine with them <coughs> excuse me important thing to remember about oral histories is that and it may seem obvious it's about them it's not about you if you're uncomfortable it doesn't matter as long as they are not uncomfortable enough to stop going forward it doesn't matter it's to help them tell their stories in the best way possible. And that's also part of what we're doing. You know, we're trying to capture these memories. We're trying to capture these stories in theory to preserve them for as long as possible to be part of our community memory, whether the community memory is the community of the college, the town, the club, whoever's collecting these stories. But also it is part of kind of a cathartic experience for people as well often to tell their stories. You know, a lot of, a lot of people don't tell their stories. You know, you may have plenty of people in your life, but no one's asked you about these important events and you never have the opportunity to present it. So, you know, it's not just about us taking their memories and putting them away somewhere for future use. It's also allowing them to tell their stories, whether or not that is a cathartic experience for them. It's good if it is, if it's good for them. Okay. And this may seem self-evident. Um, don't argue with them. Don't correct them. Um, you know, if they give a date about something, don't, unless they say, well, was it really 1968? Do you know? Don't jump in and say, no, it was 1968. Um, this can be particularly important when family members are doing oral histories. <coughs> Excuse me. And actually, my recommendation would be, if at all possible, to not interview a family member. You know, with doing oral history is slightly differently, but if you have, like if you have a grandfather who had served in World War II, you know, if you're the only person who can interview him, that's one thing. 
but it's often better to not know the person you're interviewing really intimately. Now, there will be exceptions. Again, um, the African-American group here in town who did a lot of oral histories, um, these are people over several generations who know each other very well. And that was a slightly different, there's always those exceptions that prove the rule. But from the get-go, it's often better to have someone interview somebody who they're not directly related to, and also to someone that they may not be really emotionally close to. And also you may find that you do, let's say grandpa is a great interview. You interview him, he's such a great interview, you're also recommending for the local high school kid to interview him who's doing a project on World War II. You may get completely different information if someone else is interviewing them. I mean, it's really, it's accurate in very many ways, it just happens. Now that said, a lot of genealogists, you know, as I mentioned, part of genealogy methodology is to interview your family. So that again is slightly different. But if you are interviewing your family, if you are interviewing somebody you know, um, don't correct them. Again, don't ever correct the person unless they're asking you for confirmation for a date. And don't be afraid of appearing stupid or uninformed. In, um, you know, I mentioned that for our memory lab, I train the volunteers. And for the memory lab at Urbana Public Library, most of those volunteers, particularly most of those oral history volunteers, are teenagers. Um, and until she went to another system recently, the two women who set up our memory lab, one of which was the teen librarian. So she was pulling from a lot of her patron base, a lot of the, the, the kids in her, in her, and whatever, like the teen club, whatever it is called down there. Um, and that's also one of the largest ones in our system. So they were doing a lot of the interviews besides helping with the scanning and so on and so forth in the memory lab. So they were the ones that I was training. We also had a few um, adults, and some of them have been continuing on as well. But I was particularly telling the teens this because teens are young, they're, they're teens. And, you know, if they're interviewing somebody about Vietnam, you know, they may not know, who, I mean, it may sound silly, they may not know who Nixon is, you know. Um, if you don't know something that someone is saying, you know, don't necessarily interrupt them at that time, but don't be afraid to go back and say, well, you know, I have no idea about Saigon. Tell me about Saigon. Where is Saigon? Ask for clarification. Don't ever be afraid. Again, don't interrupt. But don't ever be afraid to ask for clarification. If you don't know, um, it's a good bet that who, someone else listening to it isn't going to know. So if you do have to ask for, well, tell me again exactly, you know, where was that road? Um, and actually, even if it's something that you know, but you know that not everybody else knows, it doesn't hurt to get clarification. Two of the oral history interviews I did for our memory lab, I did with a gentleman who's actually the president of our African-American group, and he grew up near the Urbana Library, and I'm familiar with that area. Um, and the really best thing about doing oral histories, if particularly if you do any sort of oral history training, if you um, support any sort of oral history programs, you know, I would tell you that even if you're just, the, not just, but if you're the facilitator for an oral history program, if you're the coordinator, do a couple of oral histories, because then you suddenly realize all the things that you do that you tell other people not to do. Um, watching my two interviews, I was like, my God, I tell people not to do that. And one of the things that I did was I knew where he was talking about, you know? And so, like, we're both, I'm like pointing, oh, you mean that way? And he's like, yes. Well, I should have said, do you mean as a library to the left? You know, clarification. So think about clarification for those things that you don't know, those things that you think other people won't know, and also think very much kind of, kind of, if you were listening to this 50 years from now, would you have any idea what they were talking about? You know, ask for things like road names, ask for any sort of physical identification that would help someone figure out if they were listening to that in the future where it was. But again, don't be afraid of appearing stupid or uninformed. If you don't know, someone else may not know. And also, it's another way to continue the interview on, and you may say, well, you know, where is Saigon? And then that might start a whole other memory. So come in with a list of questions, don't be tied to your questions, and, you know, let them talk and let them have moments of silence and let them get emotional and don't, don't, don't correct people. And more importantly, pay attention. You know, this is a, it's, it's kind of a conversation, but not, but it may seem silly, but, you know, look at them, you know. Now pay attention, you know, shake your head, smile, um, really make it clear that you are listening to them. You know, don't spend a lot of time staring at your questions, looking at we the clock, the you know, we have enough time, we do not have enough time. But pay attention know, to what they're saying and doing. 
if you're still here with your um, short I think I lost the slides somewhere. Uh, they may come up later on. But going back, we go back a couple of slides to making sure your equipment works. Um, there's and also some kind of real kind of basics that may appear silly things. So when you're setting up your oral history environment, you know, it doesn't hurt to make sure you have a box of tissues. It doesn't hurt to make sure you have a bottle of water, both for yourself or your interview. And enhance other transportation um, Okay. <laughs> So um, besides making sure you know how your equipment works or whoever's with you know how your equipment works, um, you know, have, have tissues, have water, um, and actually have a notepad and a writing utensil because while they're talking, while you'll be paying close attention, you know, there may be things you want to write down to remember to ask somebody or like, where is Saigon? What do you mean by Urbana Pike? Um, just to go back to tell us them, and again, it's part of actually paying attention, it's just writing these notes so you don't have to interrupt as you're going along. It may seem so silly, but let me tell you, have a piece of paper, a pencil, um, tissues, because you never know. Someone may get upset. You also may just need to blow your nose. And also um, have some water. And also be real strong about the concept of personal space. Um, and that will help when you have your equipment set up. You know, it may be good to try to set up the equipment. Another way, make sure there's enough room between you and the person. The interview that I mentioned that I had done those two with the um, – the gentleman who's the president of African American group. Um, I just adore him. He's wonderful. I enjoy my conversations. And about 40 minutes into the interview, suddenly my head keeps appearing as I lean forward, as I'm paying close attention to what he's saying. And then I got excited about what he's something he said, and I'm waving my questions around. That that detracted from the interview overall, though he provides wonderful information. But you have my little head popping around in there for a little while. Um, the next time we made sure I was much further back. Or as my videographer says, I'm a very animated interviewer, so he makes sure that he keeps me far away from the person that we're interviewing. So make sure you've got enough personal space between the two of you. Um, again, it seems silly. I've been talking to you, moving around. Okay, I'm uh, going back to the details, okay? As I mentioned, I am not a folklorist. I am a genealogist librarian. Um, I train teenagers to do local his to do um, oral histories. Paperwork is a good thing. You know, having some sort of release form can be very, very important. And because I'm an archivist, because things do come into my facilities, it's good to have those release forms, both for the interviewer, the interviewee, and the videographer. Often you won't get these, particularly when people are doing family interviews, they often don't bother creating, you know, like kind of beads of gift or release form. But you never know. You never know where it's going to end up. You never know where those interviews will end up in a, like, well, we're just doing it for fun. We're just doing it for the family. And then they do end up in some sort of facility in the future. Now, plenty of institutions allow people to use oral histories where they don't have release forms. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing, but a lot of us in the, in the local history, you know, trenches, we have these. We're never going to have the release forms. We still let people utilize them. But it's best not. So it's best to, at the very start of your project, before you even do your first oral history, create some sort of release form and do have people sign off on it. Um, you can find plenty of samples of these online in different oral history academic books. Um, I have, at the end, I have a recommended book and also a website that we'll find this kind of information. And I even tell my genealogists, again, this is important to do, because while you may think you're just interviewing grandma, Families, you know, as a genealogy librarian, I've seen families get very unpleasant with each other. And there could be some relative in the future who, like, why did you interview grandma? You had no right to interview. You know, you just never know what's going to happen. So even if you just have family release forms, not a bad thing to do. Um, it's kind of like always having a will. Make sure you always have, you know, your driver's license so you protect yourself legally. And Again, because I'm not an academically trained oral historian and I'm not a folklorist, I'm not going to go into the whole concept of who actually owns the interview in regards to is it the interviewee. But those are the sort of ethical issues that when you read oral history books that will be talked about and particularly folklorists have some very strong views about that. And also then who has the rights to said interviews. So again, release forms are a good thing. Okay. It's also not a bad thing to send a thank you note at the end. It's just kind of, you know, did your mother raise you right? Um, you know, it's always good to do that kind of, it also kind of like formally closes the circle of the interview. You know, if you start out with, you know, you met ahead of time or you talked ahead of time or you sent them an email and you did the survey, you did the research, you did the interview, you send, a, they find the forms, you thank it, thank you, you send a thank you and now it's all, it's one big package with a bow on it. You know, you have finished that process and you could go on to the next. And longevity, you know, 
you often not you're doing an oral history for a particular reason. Again, unless you're just doing it for a good time, which there's a perfectly fine thing to do with that. I doubt if a lot of us either have the time or have the volunteers to just go forth to do interviews just for a good time, while they're always a lot of fun to do. Um, you know, what is going to happen to this interview? What is the thought about how will it last the test of time, even if that test of time is just five weeks from now, okay? Will you transcribe it? Transcription is a wonderful thing. It is incredibly, can be incredibly expensive. It can be incredibly time consuming. Of all the interviews that I have in this collection, particularly, we've got some wonderful, some superb Veterans History Project interviews. None of them are transcribed. They're on disk, but they're not transcribed. And the problem with electronic things is that they die sometimes. Um, so that 100 years from now, will someone be able to read that disk? If it's transcribed, then all the better. I mentioned I had just gotten in a very large collection from our local community college where kids in the honors program had to do an oral history for several years. They started out doing oral histories relating to civil rights. They moved on to veterans. They moved on to family members. I got, I got, I got an oral history with the head of the Klan who lived here in Fredericksburg. I got some good stuff. And I will hand it to my colleague who was the professor handling that. Everyone I came in, Pretty much. I mean, there are some we can tell they got to see because not all the paperwork's there. But they all have release forms. They all have the transcript. They all have the interview on either audio or, or video. Some of them, it's, it was a couple of years, so I have some on little teeny tapes. I have some on DVDs. Um, but they all have transcriptions. So I have it in various formats. Um, the transcriptions being the most, probably the most permanent. But the audio are great too, and the video are great. You know, transcription is more likely to be permanent because it's paper and particularly if you take care of it. But with video, you actually get to see somebody. And that adds a whole other layer to oral histories, which I haven't even mentioned, where, you know, transcription is great. You know, in a lot of oral histories, you may be doing oral histories to finally write a book on a particular topic. That's wonderful. But being able to actually look at somebody when they're speaking and their mannerisms, that's a whole different aspect to it. And of course, even if you just hear the voice, that's a whole different aspect to it. So if you have them on tape, on your phone, you have them somewhere, if nothing else, for God's sakes, back them up. Make sure that you have a variety of um, them located in various formats. What's that new archival term? Many things keep things safe. Lots. Lots yes. of stuff. Keep stuff. Wait, lots of copies keep stuff. Lots of copies keep things safe. Yeah. Make lots of copies. With the oral histories that we're doing through the memory lab, um, we have them in four different places. We have them on my my work laptop. They're on our F drive, as we call it. They're on our on our countywide drive. We have them in many places. One day, maybe some of them will be transcribed. That they never happen, but we have them in lots of places. So at least then, if one if the server blows up, they're on the laptop. So think of it that way. Um, and if you can try and transcribe them, transcribe. I mean, I've got some, particularly one Vietnam interview that I have to find a way to transcribe it because it is so good. And while it's good for me, you know, it could be the person who has my job, people from now will never be able to utilize it. And will just remember longingly that Tommy Nykirk's Vietnam interview was supposed to be wonderful. So we're doing it in order to usually to create some sort of document that can be used by researchers, whether those researchers are family members, whether or not those researchers are future people understanding segregated Frederick County, they need to find a way to utilize these items. Okay, and I mentioned those memory lab volunteers. On um, the volunteers we use mostly are, are, are teenagers. And the way it worked is at the beginning of memory lab, when it first got up and running, we had kind of a large volunteer training where I spoke to them pretty much everything I said to you, I also said to the teenagers. Um, then also we had a local historian here, uh, Chris Haw, who is our local documentary guy. He's done four different documentaries on Frederick County topics. Um, Chris also came in and provided training to them. So we kind of did it two ways. You know, the way coming from Chris, who is um, a public historian, you know, he's actually, his degree was in communications, so he had a minor in history, but has been the guy here in Frederick doing documentaries for most of his adult life. Um, and so he came through it for that angle, and I came through it for my angle, again, of being the jaded archivist who has now seen the light and thinks that oral history is a wonderful thing to do and you must spread the gospel. Um, and then after that one experience, and almost everyone in that room, I think there were 15 people in the room, and most of them were teenagers, a few adults, 
And then now whenever any new team volunteers come in, I essentially go down to down to up to Ur oh, it's down to Urbana and I sit down with them for about a half hour and tell them everything that I've told you. Also pressing upon them um, the importance of their task, not to make them feel like they're carrying the weight of the world on them. But you know, this is important. Doing an oral history can be an important thing. Um, collecting these memories from someone are important. Giving them the opportunity to tell their story is important. Collecting it from our view in order for it to be a document type that can be used in the future is important. You know, this is this is important stuff. And every teenager that I have interfaced with is at least, you know, making believe to me that they get the importance behind that. Um, but they really do seem to understand and realize that, you know, they are doing God's work when they're doing oral histories for us. This is a book that I would highly recommend by Don Ritchie, who was the historian for the Senate for many years and really a leader in oral history. I think it's the third edition is the most recent one. Um, this would be like more very textbooky, but it's worth having um, even if you don't sit down and you know, I'm not saying it's great bathtub read, though it might be, um, but you may just want to have a copy. If you do anything to do, if you have anything to do with oral histories, you should have a copy of this in your institutional collection um, and you should just go to it regularly. It's just a really, really good thing. And then I also find very handy the information that Library of Congress has up through the Veterans History Project. I particularly like that they do have sample release forms. So they have a sample veterans release form, a sample interviewers release form. They also have the biographical data form, all those sorts of things that you know you use to collect that information ahead of time. LC, uh, as you guys are probably all familiar with the Veterans History Project, you know, which came out of um, Congress years ago, and then you know it has a home in Library of Congress, and particularly early on, it was very much again very grassroots. You know, so many we only have so many World War II veterans left. We must go forth and collect their memories, and was very much a push out into the communities to encourage Boy Scouts, DAR, libraries, League of Women Voters, American Legions to go out and do these interviews. And then some of them, if you wanted to send them back to LC or find local repositories. So they have all, because it came out of LC, because LC was kind of the guiding light here, even when they were encouraging, you know, Eagle Scouts to go out and do this and then to give it to their public library, it had that nice push background on it, making sure that at least everyone was aware of the legal paperwork behind it. Because again, in the most perfect of worlds, and few of us work in these most perfect of worlds, if you have the collection of, his, of oral histories, you should theoretically have the paperwork that allows you to provide access to these materials. It doesn't always happen, as I said, probably ad nauseum, but it's good to have them and they provide wonderful examples of them, which you can just download, you can steal, you can copy, you can you know, make for your own sorted purposes, but lots of really good things. And particularly if you're lo working with volunteers, or working particularly with teenagers or really anyone, the idea of, you know, it's one thing for me to say, go out there and interview them before you interview them or give them a phone call. But if you have the data sheet, you know, use the LC data sheet, change a certain, you know, particularly for your needs, you'll collect the information that you need. You'll, you'll ask their full names or ask who their parents are. Not that you're not going to ask that at the beginning of the interview anyhow, but it's a way to keep track of what you're collecting. Ooh, I think I'm at the end. Yeah. Ooh. Um, one more thing, um, you know, as I talked about how to make sure you've got this boundary space between the interviewer and the interviewee, I mentioned that our African American group has been doing some oral histories. Three weeks ago they had an opening of a documentary that they themselves created calling Tale of the Lion, which completely changed the nature of, of Frederick County local history. But in that some documentaries, you know, there's a, like think of the Ken Burns model. There's a script, you then pull in the oral histories in order to answer those questions. So what was it like, you know, Antietam was a bloody field, and then you have people talking about how Antietam was a bloody field. What um, Arch did, the African American group did, is they took their 77 minutes of documentary and they went from person to person and they'd have, I don't know exactly, let's make it, they had seven minutes from one person talking about their life and then seven minutes from another person talking about their life. So it was really more kind of, instead of going to the script, it was this person and this person and this person. And it very much had the boundary where you just saw that person. Then we got to an interview with one of, one of the older living treasures and she was telling her story and then they pulled out and she was there with her interviewer and he was holding her hand. And it was an incredibly touching moment. Now it was not an artificial moment. Um, it wasn't just like, you know, make sure that you look as if you really care about what they're talking about. 
but it was amazingly effective. So what I'm saying here is, again, not to go forth and create false emotional experiences, but, you know, if you are really talking to somebody and they are really responding to you, and if it is someone you know, or even if it isn't someone you know, and they start really telling this emotional story, don't be afraid to have your own responses as well. You know, it's all about them. You are just the facilitator. But if there is a human moment there, it's not a bad thing to have the human moment there. I really, of the 77 minutes, and this was a wonderful documentary, which I cannot say enough about, but that one little moment almost brought me to tears because, again, they just pulled out, and it wasn't done just for emotional reasons, um, to just see him there holding her hand. And I know for a fact this is someone that he knows very well. Actually, she's, she has since died. And um, it, was, it was an incredibly moving moment. So don't be afraid to have those incredibly moving moments on your side and the side of your interviewees as well. So that's all I got for today. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, so actually, I have I have some questions and um, sorry, no, I'm like, uh, there we go. <laughs> I I have some questions that I think you guys might have, but I want to check the chat box and um, see if we have any questions in there. Uh, nope, we're good for now. But um, so yes. the thing, just to set up for you guys, um, the thing that's really interesting about the Urbana or the Frederick County yes. Public Library um, Memory Lab model that's different from the DC memory lab model um, is that they have a an oral history recording suitcase, you know, yes. part of the lab. Um, and it's in one of those, you know, um, Pelican cases that you can take um, the equipment around. I, I have a list of what is in their um, memory lab of all of their, and, and it's all mobile, mm -hmm. um, so they can fit it into like, I think one SUV Right, and, yeah. and take it around um, because their Frederick County is very large for Maryland. Yes, we're a large again mm -hmm. small for Texas, but right, exactly the largest the largest so physical Houston. county in Maryland. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so so I'll send this along to you guys what they have in in their memory lab, um, just so that you can see and you know compare and contrast. But I know that you all have asked questions about oral history and maybe adding that to your memory lab while it's not. The basic of, of the DC model. Mm -hmm. um, I really want to help help you guys help set you guys up for pot potentially either getting another grant or convincing your administration to add this to your um, memory lab if you're interested. So I'll I'll send you that. But I know that it is a pretty easy, um, like good quality equipment. Like Mary mentioned, yeah. have an external mic. That is very very important. Um, and there's a lot of like kind of technical things that I'm sure you can that are out there, and I can provide a lot. We can provide a lot more resources, I'm sure, um, about you know making sure that there's not like a, a call in, someone calling, <laughs> <laughs> weird noise calling in, uh, or like a very loud refrigerator yeah. going, or and you actually know. something else I missed. Another one of my slides that disappeared, I had 1.5 missing slides, is also kind of like, like what we were saying with, the, with those other people who called in, you know, go into the room where you're going to be doing yeah. this and can you hear the street? Do you hear the typewriters? Not, not even have typewriters, but do you hear the sounds? Next, is it next to the story time room? That may be a bad thing. And then what does it look like visually? Um, if we had the camera focusing another way, for the um, the gentleman that I interviewed, I've done two interviews with him. I'm going to do a third interview in two weeks. We did it in this room on the other side of this table, and it's right behind our shades. And on the shades is still the little tag of, like, not to strangle yourself with the shade. Mm -hmm. And every time I look at that interview, you know, I have this wonderful, interesting, handsome man that tells wonderful stories that I enjoy spending time with. And all I can see in the back is why in God's name haven't I taken the label off the shade? Mm -hmm. And then also in the front, because we have this large map that we are going to actually, in the third interview, we're having him kind of walk through this map as Urbana was when he was growing up. And we have a microfilm box, because the map's been rolled, and we had the map rolled out on this table, and he was at the other end, and we had the microfilm box on the end keeping the map flat. He never got the map. So all I can see is the tag oh, and the yeah. box. Mm -hmm. So see what it is that you see, you know, that's not what everyone's going to be looking at, but it's whatever I looked into, that's all I can see. It's like, mm -hmm. can we cut that out somehow? It's right. like, the, so in the other interview, I had my head popping around the last five minutes, in this one, all I could look at is the tag. 
So do look at the environment. Like we would probably wouldn't do it in here with the Hollinger boxes staring at us. Right. Um, you know those things that take Fluorescent away from lighting. The yes, exactly. Um, and then, but then also there are windows on the other side of this room, so you don't want to backlight anyone because then you won't be able to see their face, and that's a really great part of having videos to be able to see their facial yes. expressions and cues and things like that. Um, so uh, for this, they have um, a Canon HD camcorder with a memory card and, you know, some bag, bags to uh, carry that and then a tripod, a lavalier microphone, which is that external mm -hmm. microphone that you can just clip on. Um, and I think that's about that seems it. Like it. I also yeah. have I also have the same set in the Maryland room. Mm -hmm. So there's the set that they bought with the Memory Lab money, and then I have my set that we got with the Latino American grant money. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it is small. I mean, it looks, and also, while I have gone out of my way not to learn how to use it, it looks easy enough to learn. Yeah. It looks easy enough yeah. to learn. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the important thing in testing things out. It's really huge. So um, so that's uh, their Memory Lab model that I think is is really interesting. And and can I ask why why teenagers? Like obviously because it was kind of the Memory Lab was started in um, in the teen services. I think that's essentially how it yeah. happened. When they wrote the grant, the grant was written by the two women down in Urbana, mm -hmm. one of whom was the teen librarian. Becca and Michelle. Becca and Michelle, yep. yes. Um, and it came, it's funny, I know it's funny, but it sort of came out of, as I understand it, came out, the concept kind of came out of the head of our children's program. Mm -hmm. So from there it went to Urbana to write this grant. So the fact is that it kind of came out of, as compared to coming out of adult programming, it came mm -hmm. out of children's programming, mm -hmm. and the fact that Michelle was there, and also that we had, she has a large group of teens, and it was essentially a captive volunteer audience. Mm -hmm. It was a group of people who she thought she could get on board pretty quickly, a group of people who also some of them wanted to do community service. Mm -hmm. So it was really just having a captive audience. And is that, so that's the thing that I, <laughs> I'm just so amazed at that, Yes, I was that nerd in high school that I would totally, and nerd, I'm using nerd as a cool nerd. <laughs> the cool um, nerd. Yeah, the cool nerd. nerds are cool now. Um, but I was a nerd in high school that would do this and think it was great fun. Um, but, you know, I was, I wouldn't say there was a, a large group of us. So Well, yeah, I don't think she's got 65 okay. of them. Okay. But yeah. there is an active contingent. And I meant to call Becca, you know, because I'm a half hour, I'm a long way from her band. Right. Um, I meant to call Becca to find out how many were still working on it and how many interviews were actually done, mm -hmm. but it's more than I thought it was, and there are still volunteers mm -hmm. who, still team volunteers who are mm -hmm. working on it. And I think, too, and leaving aside the nerd aspect of it, there's the other kind of nerd aspect of it where you do have, they're also a big part of learning to use the the, equip, the memory, the straight memory lab equipment. Yeah. They're the ones who help people normally. They're coming into scan and what so on and so forth. So you've kind of got that, you know, IT nerd side, which mm -hmm. is, of course, they say we're as cool as the history nerd side. <laughs> um, but you do have that, that, that group of them. Also, um, Urbana is, and I think one of the reasons, I don't know, one of the reasons that I at least talk about it being in Urbana, I don't know what they actually had in mind um, when they were, I, when Becca, I know Becca pretty well. She was one of my students years ago. Um, and obviously, I know Michelle is my colleague, but they had talked to me when they were writing the grant. But it kind of went to Urbana because Urbana is our most diversified branch, shall we say? You know, it's it's in the northern, as you know, it's in the southern part of Frederick County, next to Montgomery County, which is more and more the D.C. suburb than Urbana is. And Urbana is, while there is a historic Urbana, historic Urbana is this big, new Urbana is this big, and it's a much different community. It's more culturally diversified. Mm -hmm. Besides just being more culturally diversified, that there's people moving from Montgomery County up here, there are people of much different ethnic mix coming up here. Mm -hmm. So it was the idea of collecting the stories coming out of Urbana because of the diversified population. And I think also, and I may be lying about this, I'm not sure I am completely lying about it, Michelle had teens who themselves were diversified. Mm -hmm. so, so she had some teens who came from the less stereotypical white or African-American Frederick County families. Mm -hmm. She had some teens who were bilingual. And uh, some of them, and I don't know if they actually ended up doing interviews, but several of the kids that I taught were ones who were, whose intention was to do interviews in Spanish mm -hmm. so that they were coming up that way. So I don't know if that's another reason why it was put in Urbana that's kind of a, a more interesting part of the Frederick community 
or a part of the Frederick community that I would say we need to actually document a whole lot more. Here in Frederick County, we spend so much time being concerned about our 18th century Germans um, that we spend less time being concerned about our new incoming people. And the Latino American grant, part of that, the oral history component of that was to start documenting our new arrivals to Frederick County coming from you know, Latin countries, which is relatively new for, I mean, while there may have been people here from South America for most of the 20th century, we're fixated on our Germans mm -hmm. and we don't document these people. So it was a part of documenting that story and also just documenting the 20th century, which is, I wouldn't say it's a new or 21st century at this point in time. It's not a new phenomena in local history and it's something that most of the people I know who have jobs like me have, have been doing for, you know, years, but doing it more formally. And again, some, the only way we're going to be picking up some of these stories, at least at this point in time, is in the oral history. So I think that's another reason that she got some of those teams on board, the idea of documenting the communities in which they now live. Um, because I think, again, with some of the ones that I taught, they're very aware that they are, like, setting a new for the county. Mm -hmm. Yes, fun fact, I went to Urbana High School. Um, and I think I was the fourth graduating class. It's a brand new high school, which then, like, Three years after I graduated, they added this huge addition to because there's so many people that moved into Urbana. Um, and I was the editor in chief of uh, my senior year yearbook, which, as we all know now, your books are very important documents uh, to keep. Yep. And um, the theme for our yearbook was urbanization because Urbana was changing so much way, way back in 2003. And uh, it's like night and it's, day. Yeah, I was going to say, like, this was, it's like a half hour away from my, where I used to live and went to high school, but this was my, uh, my library. Yeah, because it was, one down there. it was the only right. library. Um, so, yeah. So I came here a lot. Um, <laughs> at, well, first I went to the interim location. Yes. And then the, this was the new fancy renovated one. Um, so, so I feel like for a lot of uh, you guys will want to be documenting your changing, um, changing, you know, neighborhood and communities, but then also uh, for Crook, I know you guys have, you know, said that you want to document language and, yeah. and other aspects that I think video oral histories would be perfect for that and incorporate in the nice scanner that we're um, putting out there for you guys to then like, you know, have people bring in their um, stuff. Maybe you can get volunteers and scan the, their stuff or at least look at their photos and things like that and kind of incorporate that into the yeah. oral history. I don't know how often you guys do that. You know, should. <laughs> we, ha yeah, we haven't really, um, what I know of the Veterans History Project interviews that we have, they have done a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Throughout the, a lot of, almost all the Veterans History Project interviews that I've seen, which is only a small portion of the several hundred we have, you'll see them like, you know, holding up their photographs or mm -hmm. showing their medals or showing mm -hmm. their uniforms. So that was very much integrated in that. That is something that I really need to, when I when I teach, need to make sure that they integrate in regards to the Urbana interviews. Um, a little bit, I'm gonna digress a little bit to, mm -hmm. us, to, the, to the third interview I'm gonna be doing with this gentleman who grew up in Urbana. Um, again, we have this map that was done by the developers of Urbana, um, right when they were getting ready to develop it. They, leaving aside that they're developers, particularly early on, and not anything against developers, um, but that they have had a certain more historical orientation than a lot of Frederick County developers. It doesn't mean that Urbana hasn't been pillaged, but it does. <laughs> but, you know, they went in with a, a better heart, mm -hmm. shall we say. So they do have this map that shows downtown Urbana, which is about a block long, and I'm talking a little block, not a Baltimore City block. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to take um, this gentleman who grew up in Urbana, in the 50s into the 60s. He was the only African-American family in that area. There are two black communities right on the other side of Urbana, but they were the only black family living in Urbana. And so it's kind of like that. And we're gonna take this map, and um, which is another reason I'm thankful I have my videographer because we're gonna actually look at the map and look at David, look at the map. And make sure it's in focus. And make sure it's in focus. <laughs> yeah. And we're gonna go um, on the map, the, you know, the block long buildings of downtown Urbana, which was never a town. You know, it was really, they call it the villages of Urbana, village. but even saying it was a village is yeah. going some, you know, yeah. it's a little teeny place. But we're going to go from building to building, like, hey, what do you remember was mm -hmm. here when you were growing up? What do you remember here when you were growing up? So it's oh, not quite cool. the same, but it will be that, you know, people will be able to see the map 
um, what I would really love to do for my fourth interview with him, he's he's a wonderful interview, um, is to actually then take him to Urbana. Mm -hmm. But I haven't. Um, he's like a walk through. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That would um, I would really love to do that. Yeah. Love to do that. He also has a lot of opinions about um, not in a negative, but like downtown Urbana now, like mm -hmm. that you know you can't you know get through the can't go to the bank drive through because there's Starbucks in the way that kind of thing. Right, 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 um, right. But you know it is part of the history of the community, and mm -hmm. it's the only way you're going to glean that information. I mean, we could do title searches on all those properties, but to have someone say, oh, you know, when I was a 14 year old black boy in Urbana, I cut the grass for all these people in the area. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a much different experience. And then, mm -hmm. again, they were the only African-American family. And also what's really um, fascinating to me, besides the change, I mean, again, he's a wonderful interview. He's a great age. And Urbana, so we see through him, we see um, segregated Frederick County. Mm -hmm. We also see the growth of Urbana. And mm -hmm. also see the changing nature of childhood. I mean, this guy, when he was a little boy, walked miles all around there. And now we're in a time when kids don't even stand at the bus stop by themselves. Mm -hmm. But he would walk almost into Montgomery County and wow. come up to Frederick. So it's just, I guess the point of this, besides how much I love interviewing this man, is that, um, you know, you may go in going, okay, we're going to interview about this topic. But everything is multi-layered. You know, his, as we all know, history is an onion. You know, you do this great interview on integration, but also you end up finding out about what it was like to be a little boy in, in a rural Frederick County, in an area where it's not rural anymore, and kids don't have that same level of freedom. Mm -hmm. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah, it's true. Do we have any other questions for Mary from our, our guests today, from our library partners on oral histories, genealogy even? I'm open. <laughs> I'll be checking the chat box. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. <laughs> I was kind of curious about dictation. You know, adding the um, adding the words at the bottom for hearing impaired or oh. what? What do mm -hmm. you do for that? Absolutely nothing. But we should, particularly not only should we, but also we live in a community that has one of the largest deaf schools in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I think at one point in time, we actually had a, a deaf person um, sign up to be interviewed. And I think it didn't play out in the end, but they had an interpreter because we had the teenager, we had the interpreter that the, that the person was bringing their interpreter. And because there was a lot of concern about, you know, with the camera, what, you know, what to do with the camera. Um, but we need to do that. That's something we simply should do because we are in a community that has a lot of deaf people where there's a deaf school that we are constantly trying to get them to use our collections more mm -hmm. and more. And it's not something that we have done and it's something that we should do. And I should probably talk to Becca about that because that also might be something, not that it's all about money, that we might be able to get a community foundation grant to take care mm -hmm. of in some ways because we have been trying to set out into that community. That's, you know, that's always, I'm sure you're all because you all do programming and outreach and that kind of stuff, but reaching different parts of our community. And our deaf community is one that, you know, they're right here in, I mean, the deaf school is about two blocks away from us. It's the Maryland School for the Deaf. Maryland School for the Deaf. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a feeder, call, a feeder school to Gallaudet. You mm -hmm. know, it's elementary and high school. I frequently will have genealogists in here, who, you know, people who move to this community to make sure their kids or their grandkids attend the school. I mean, we have a lot, it's, it's an important part of our community, but even though it's two blocks away, it's a very, in some ways, isolated community. We have regularly done outreach to them. Other parts of our library have, you know, done other sorts of programming of them. We used to have a TTY phone in our old building and people would come in and use the TTY. Um, so it is a thing we need to reach out to, and actually video is, is a good way to mm -hmm. capture that mm -hmm. because we're not capturing the role of the school in the community the way that I think we'd like to. I did have a group of, of four boys from the high school who were in on Friday, and you know I was talking about primary sources and showing them old things and showing them microphone. And then we have a really nice set of their yearbooks mm -hmm. from school because we also have the papers from one of their previous superintendents, and with that came a number of the yearbooks. And at the end, they always like to look at the yearbooks because often they they know the teachers or, the, or their parents are in there. And something that I found fascinating is they were pointing out um, different, like the old time hearing aids from the 1970s. But when I was talking to their teacher, we were talking about, you know, that they knew people. And I said, well, yeah, they need to see that experience. But the fact is that people moved here to go to that school and they stay here. 
Um, and we're not doing enough to document it. So that would particularly videography would be a good way to go about yeah. that, doing that. And there's, um, I mean, so I think that there are, you know, there's actually, there's been a lot more um, laws put in place mm -hmm. recently about um, that kind of accessibility. Um, but if you don't put the videos, I think that's more if you put the videos online or mm -hmm. probably so. I, I feel like it's, it, it's but then also, I'm not sure, obviously, like, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but yeah. I w if you guys have any kind of accessibility department, or I'm sure not everyone does, um, or, you know, uh, someone that you can consult about um, making making your content more accessible, I know that also there... I, that there are there are some some free open source tools out there mm, that to, to add it. That. So yep. if you if you have the transcription available, you could add it into the video pretty easily. Um, I feel like YouTube kind of has an option for that too, but be careful about YouTube because then they, they you have to sign their right. agreement and then they'll try and sell, potentially sell it, et cetera, et cetera. So there, but there you know there are some potential tools out there, and I think that. If you transcribe it, that's a really, really great first step that I think um, is is a tough a tough enough hurdle in general. Um, let's see, I think Kurt said something. Oh, that's good. Uh, Kurt has used, or Suzanne has used um, Rev.com. Okay, that's good to know. To create closed captions for oral history, um, they're now required for that's any wonderful. videos going on, yeah. on our library. Yeah, YouTube. that's it. So Rev.com. And there is in the chat box. Oh wait, that looks like it's private. Um, I'm gonna just copy this again and send it out, and I'll send it in Slack too. Um, thank you so much. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's great. really great to know. And also, even just you know, I think about like when I was in museum school many years ago, and they would talk about you know handy, you know, having something wheelchair accessible. They go mm -hmm. on. It's not only good for that. It's also good for you know, pregnant people or someone who mm -hmm. sprained their ankle. Mm -hmm. And in oral histories, even just someone's, you know, really thick accent, mm -hmm. even if they're just from East Baltimore, you know, can help yeah. accessibility. Yeah. So that's sort of, I, I'm, I'm ashamed that I've never given it any thought whatsoever, <laughs> particularly living in a community with a large deaf population, um, but it can meet so many other needs. Anything that can, and even just, you know, sometimes, again, people's accents, even their local, it doesn't have to be there from, you know, Portugal, um, just their local accents. Sometimes people just mumble. Um, sometimes people, as they get older, too, their their diction is less clear. Not to make mm -hmm. gross generalizations, but anything like that can help everyone who's ever going to look mm -hmm. at your item. So, um, thank you. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to take that back to Becca. See, we have a great group here. I know they're wonderful. <laughs> Any other questions or uh, thoughts of what you guys do um, for oral histories, describing them? Closed captioning also helps videos appear higher in search engines. Ooh, who do I didn't know that. That's a good point. Yeah, because people can search for things yeah. um, and then find yeah, things yeah. is also good. And a bunch of the um, STC ones I keep alluding to, those Frederick are Frederick Community College. College. Frederick mm -hmm. Community College mm -hmm. are a, a bunch of, yes, not the FCC. Yeah. yeah. Um, they are selected interviews will be going up on Digital Maryland right. in the near future. Okay. So that is particularly good. We're probably going to put the transcripts up, but for some that are particularly good, there could be some really mm -hmm. great ones. And, man, someday we'll have, uh, you know, that whole, like, video or speech to text that'll actually be oh, worthwhile, oh. like automatic software doing that, but nobody's really developed that yet. I felt oh. like I saw something. Also, one other thing that we're eventually going to be doing with many more of our oral histories, but we started doing it with our Veteran History Project interviews, is that actually um, it, my archival materials aren't in our online catalog. You know, we're creating, you know, coming from the archival viewpoint, we're creating traditional finding aids that will eventually link in. But we've started creating, not me, but my volunteer cataloger, creating catalog records for our manuscript collections, just like little baby, man, you know, collection level descriptions. Mm -hmm. But some of the really good Veterans History Project interviews, if you go into our catalog, there's a catalog, like I used the Vietnam interview with Thomas Nykirk, which is superb. Um, that is in our catalog, just if you just search Vietnam, that will come up and then, mm -hmm. you know, the interview is not there, but it'll then direct you to, you know, our yeah. oral history collection. Oh, yeah. right. Gotcha. Yes. Um, also, I saw a chat that LA said, don't avoid shooting in rooms with mirrors. Good thought. Yes. Because then you could catch yourself in the reflection. That would be bad. It's probably also really bad. Um, what and is light this? reflection. Yeah, and the, um, what's the Chinese? 
Feng Shui. It's probably very oh, bad Feng yes. Shui too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. True. Or you could get artsy with it. Any other questions for Mary on oral histories or thoughts, other tips? Um, chat. Okay. So then I will just open it up. Um, do you guys have any uh, questions about? memory labbing right now. I know we're in a little bit of a, a holding pattern with purchasing. Just gonna try and keep my life together. Um, any any thoughts? Questions? No? No great. Thank you. Go ahead. What was that? Oh, I think that it's very inspiring. I'm ready to go out and get more on history. Yay! That makes me so happy. Really? I truly, I like oral histories, yeah. But I love doing oral histories. The, after I did the first one, I was like, oh my God, this is wonderful. Why haven't I been doing mm -hmm. this for years? It's yeah. really, it's so much fun. It mm -hmm. just really is great. Do any of you guys have a statement, um that? Or are you planning on getting equipment to record? Sorry, should be more specific. I know a lot. Of you probably, yeah. Uh, story, story core equipment, like recording equipment. Yes. That's great. We could probably use some new video equipment. Our video equipment's pretty outdated, but. Okay. Aaron says they just got oral history equipment. Oh, good. So they could participate in the veterans. History, History project. project. Great. Great. That's wonderful. Uh, but we're going to use it for other oral histories too. That's that's how I did with my exactly. Latino American stuff. Yeah. 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 And that's. Um, I I think it would be really interesting if it, um and everyone wants to share on Slack or something what you have bought. L. A. is getting audio oral history equipment through a separate grant. Wonderful. Um, because I think it would be so. I'll share what um is in the Urbana Memory Lab oral history equipment, um, which is just a camera and a tripod. Yeah, and I don't think it's really expensive, all yeah. things considered. I don't yeah. think it was all that expensive. Yeah, and you could go even further, um, and I'll share some additional resources too, um, more from, I guess, the technical end. You could go further and buy a whole kit and spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You can, But I think everyone probably wants them to be pretty mobile, yeah. is my guess. Um, and then, but the, like the story core things that I'm thinking of are like they're their own booths that people then come to your library and visit mm -hmm. and record their own. But um, I know that everyone is probably taking a lot of wants to take it to people. Um, so there's different equipment that I think that you would yes. need for that. Um, but also just keeping it simple is like. Also, um, it's not related to that necessarily, and probably you guys all know this, and particularly a lot of people are doing oral histories. Um, you know, we always give a copy of the oral history to the interviewer, mm -hmm. interviewee mm -hmm. in the end as well. <laughs> and also with the Veterans History Project things, we will pretty much give, um, you know, because when they got interviewed, again, it wasn't through us. We're the, we were their repository for many years. Now they sent to LC, but we've been their repository. Um, and they would give a copy, but now when any family member comes, if it's a family member, we will just make it, you know, we don't fight, we don't yeah. ask for a copy, we just give them a copy of the interview. Mm -hmm. And if I can do a brief commercial interruption. Okay. <laughs> for, um, right now, if you look at the virtual reality experiences on the National Mall, mm -hmm. um, there's a Time Looper is an app you can download, and there are a number, they're, they're, they're in other parts of the country, but the ones for the National Mall, the one for the Vietnam Wall and also the one for the World War II monument, the company that was working with the Park Service to create those, they first went to LC to get interviews. And LC, because LC is a big bureaucracy, and I mean that lovingly, mm -hmm. um, they essentially said, okay, this is great, but it will take us X amount of time. But if you drive up to Frederick, you can probably see them a lot quicker. Mm. So, And they, these folks were down in Arlington or Alexandria. So they sent them to, up to us. So the interviews that are represented in World War II and the Vietnam War are Frederick County interviews. For the World War II, they actually show snippets from three different interviews. Um, one of the gentlemen is still alive, um, and then from um, a woman who I think was a Rosie the Riveter kind of person, and mm -hmm. then another gentleman who served in the war. Um, you actually see their interviews. But then for the Vietnam War one, which is mm -hmm. 
fabulous. They took the interviews of the before mentioned Tommy Nykirk and they created this whole kind of um, dramatic experience where you see this actor, you know, I don't know if it's, I think it's a real person, this actor rising up out of the rice patties mm -hmm. and he's reading Tommy's letters and it is so incredible. So this is an app? Yes, Time Looper. Time Looper and yes. you just like you download it and then you have I think it's $1.99 or $2.99 or mm -hmm. something. You know, if you were at the mall, you'd be, you know, getting it Looking from the little booth, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you, it's 365 or whatever, you got to move oh. around and you it's, it's the Vietnam one kind of starts kind of like Forrest Gump where there's like a letter flying through the air and you watch it, you see the wall yeah. and then you see this person rise up. And I just cannot say enough about um Tommy Nykirk's interviews or Tommy Nykirk's letters that we have copies of. Yeah. Um, so they didn't read them directly, but there's this man talking, and it's snippets from Tommy's interviews. And then you have the background, which was developed by their web people somewhere in the Middle East, actually, mm -hmm. where we uh, they scanned photographs that because Tommy took a camera to war with him, oh, wow. and so he has all these slides. Mm -hmm. um, they're in his private hands still, but we, I'm hoping one day we'll get them. But he shares them with us when we need them, and they scan them. So that was all developed from his photographs, oh, wow. and it's just it's really incredible. But not only is it you know showing the strength of oral histories, um, particularly a guy who's a particularly wonderful interview, but also the strength of collections, you know small local history and genealogy collections mm -hmm. where things are kept in the community mm -hmm. because not only could they come up here and if they came up here before they came here I had an intern go through and pull out the best World War II and Vietnam experiences so they looked at those but then also I was able to produce Tommy Nykirk who came in and sat down and talked to them yeah, and yeah. brought the yeah. photographs in and brought the letters in but if you just really particularly you know put the money into downloading the Vietnam Wall one because it really shows you the strength of oral history, mm -hmm. just what they were able to create pulling from his letters. And again, for World War II, which is just as, as wonderful, you're seeing the interviews, but Tom is just so good. It's well, for next so time, good. you guys be your bring, homework. come into D.C. Yeah. Or come to D.C. Yeah, yes, yeah. and go to the wall and hold it there, but yeah. it's really... Oh, you can look really, at it when you're not there? I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah, sounds yeah. like I'm 80 years old. <laughs> Aren't you the hip one? You know? I'm like, I'm yes, you can download the app onto your phone from anywhere in the country, okay. and there's a small fee involved. And then you can watch um, the Ooh. Vietnam Wall if you want to watch. I have, I have one last question that I almost forgot. Um, so with Memory Lab, you, people can check it out. Yes, people can check it out. Yeah. Um, the Memory Lab or the Oral History Camera? So, so Oral History Camera. Um, they, can't, they, can, they can't take them home. They right. can use them. They can make appointments to come in and use them. Yeah. Um, the Maryland Room Camera, I will lend to Oak other history organizations mm -hmm. because we're a very small community. Mm -hmm. um, not that if it was bigger, I wouldn't trust my colleagues. Right. But I have, like, for example, I have lent it out to our African-American group. So I will lend ours out to the African-American group if they want to go out and do it. And something we've been trying to do through Memory Lab is to really get as many partner organizations as possible. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have bought in. Some of them, you know, sometimes you have to have this, Discussion sounds like the wrong term, but you have to develop this relationship that can take several years before finally they bring people in. But there have been a number of groups we've been reaching out to in order to help them through their own oral histories, mm -hmm. or also then have them, you know, use our equipment to bring their people into us. The one problem with teenagers is they cannot go anywhere. They right. cannot go to people's homes to do interviews. Right. Some of our, you know, grown-up interviewee interviewers can do that. Mm -hmm. um, but we will lend the Maryland equipment to other history organizations. But if someone wants to just want to come in and do an interview and not give us it, that's perfect. You know, that's kind of following the traditional story core model. Right, right? Exactly. Like, feel free to do it. We'd love to have a copy, but yeah. that, that's not why we're the only reason that we mm -hmm. are here. Um, which is another reason that we, I, that from my role of view, that we keep the Maryland kind of separate because we're a collecting entity. Memory yes. Lab is not the same sort of collecting exactly. entity. So we will let people do that. You can come in. Grandma's in town. Bring her on in. Go into you know a conference yeah. room and interview her and go about your business. And then <coughs> what is the what so the the recordings that get done by the Memory Lab Oral History just people just <coughs> take them home with them if, and they're. But maybe, what if there was like a really good one? Would someone send that to you? Or? Well, yeah, we encourage people if they want to use the equipment that we would love a copy of the interview. Okay. You know, the ones that are done by our volunteers or done by me, you know, those go, they're, they're yeah. done for the collection. Yeah. But if people want to come in, you know, we encourage people, you know, we'd love to have a copy of it. Mm -hmm. You know, in the same way we do not encourage. And it'll go in the Maryland room. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, it becomes part of our collection. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that's. An option. Yes, then, yes, yeah. yes. Because it allows us to also collect. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it does have two arms, you know, mm -hmm. the, the the more traditional Maryland room, I want everything in the world. 
arm and yeah. the other arm of we just want you to record your stories. Right. right. Exactly. For whatever Access reason. You're, and, exactly. And, yeah. and particularly mm -hmm. as a public library. Mm -hmm. you know. Exactly. So great. We need to check that one more time. Make sure I didn't miss anything over there. Okay. Great. Well, we it's three twenty eight, so here we are. Um thank you, Mary, so much. Oh, thank you really for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful.